Uh, starting off this morning, we have Jeff Moss of DEF COM fame. Jeff will be joining us talking about some uh, security issues around DNS root. Jeff, come on up. Thank you. Let me just get the old laptop going here. See if they switch me over. So I'm going to use this, uh, well, first of all, Welcome Atlanta, welcome Nanog. This is my first one and I'm glad it's a round number like 60. That makes me feel good. And uh, and it's interesting because I've always uh, been fascinated by Nanog. I've been subscribed to the list on and off over the years. And it's funny because um, from a security standpoint, Nanog's a really interesting group because if anything was going to go wrong, at least in the early days, um, a lot of the people in this room would be sort of the first responders. Uh, responding to an attack or an anomaly or an outage or whatever. And so it always played really heavily in our sort of uh, threat modeling. What was one of the first things you would do if you wanted to maximize chaos is you spam the nanog list or take it offline and prevent you guys from talking to each other. That would probably prolong the chaos. And it's probably a really good list to harvest all the identities of all the people that would be the first responders. So you probably want to go after them too with your automated tools to make your life hell. Uh, right in the middle of an incident. And so finally I get to talk to the group that I've been wargaming against in these other scenarios. Um, but now I have faces to my theoretical uh, attack. Hopefully none of that has ever happened to you guys and it will remain theoretical, but just know that you are on, you are all on somebody's automated attack list for that very reason. So what I've been thinking about lately is uh, several things, complexity, internet actors, DDoS volume that just keeps going up. Um, <clears throat> with my time at ICANN, I dealt a lot around issues surrounding the root of the DNS and uh, there's a growing importance of DNS. So I'm going to touch on all of these uh, issues in my talk and I'm hopefully going to have time to questions and answers at the end. So how did we get here? Started with industrialization, which was a lot of repetitive work, sort of like a script. It's a repetitive work done necessar not necessarily by skilled laborers to produce a part that's made piece by piece. And we moved on to the information age. And this was job specialization. We weren't interested in just producing uh, simple objects anymore. We're starting to make more complicated objects and uh, more intricate and more complex systems were being designed and it spawned a more professionals and more specialists. And what we find is over time specialization is the key to progress. It's the key to financial progress or maybe your career progress, right? Maybe you're more specialized in one area than the guy next to you and that makes you more valuable to the marketplace. But if you see the trend is what we're doing is we're specializing. And <coughs> In investing, if you want to make money, there's a couple of rules, there's a rule of thumb here that you specialize for larger risks but you also get larger returns, right? Put all your money in Apple. If Apple hits, you're a millionaire. If Apple tanks, you've lost all of your money. You've specialized into one stock but you get bigger reward by taking a bigger risk. To mitigate this, the, the corollary is you diversify to reduce your risk. You put all your money in a hundred different stocks and hopefully they all don't tank. So this is how as a society, at least financially, we've managed to mitigate risks. And if you look at the direction we're moving, it's specialization is what leads to this complexity. It's no longer possible for like any two of us to sit in a room and really understand the system that we've built. It used to be possible to maybe get four guys together and take over the world. You needed a routing guy, a switching guy, you needed maybe a, a good Unix hacker. Now you probably need 20 guys just to figure out what's going on in JavaScript, let alone understand the whole system. And so this complexity leads to a certain amount of fragility. Um, so I was trying to find a picture to uh, illustrate this. This is all I could find. An artist that's created this bed trying to show rising complexity from sort of randomness at one end to a very complex bed frame at the other. And that's essentially what we're doing. 
Now, one of the benefits of working at ICANN was I got to take pictures of these cool old network maps on the wall. I've tried to get them from the original source, but the original source has long since gone out of business. So all I'm and you can kind of guess where it is. Well, six years later, this is what the ARPANET looked like. Still a few enough nodes that you could understand where they all are and what they're doing. But two years later, we had to start drawing logical maps. This is a map of ARPANET by BBN. And if we jump forward to 2011, there's a great map here by Chris Harrison where he's just trying to show density of network connections. He's trying to come up with a new way of showing connectivity. You can sort of guess where the countries are underneath all of that. And I was trying to get an idea of if you go 110 years in the past, 1901, look at this map. This is the Eastern Telegraph map of connections. They're in red there if you can see them. Now look, you can sort of see, at least over the Atlantic, you can see the connections are pretty much the same they've always been 110 years later. You can even see a little connection going down to the tip there of South, Af uh, South America. It's fascinating. So geography really does play sort of a key routing uh, point in the way that we've laid out our networks. And today Google's trying to show us different ways to manage this complexity. Right? We're not going to show connectivity anymore. Now we're just showing things based on size or based on presence. And it's forcing us to visualize the network in new ways. And what this is trying to, what I take away from this is that the system has gotten highly complex. No one view of it is real anymore. And my concern with this is that the failure modes of these complex systems are impossible to predict. They've been impossible to predict for a while now. Um, and we just all have to live with it. Right? There's not going to be a system that you can predict the failure modes anymore. And if you accept that, that's going to change your behavior. You're going to have to be more flexible. Here's an example. Um, here's some cameras designed to watch license plates. Fairly simple system. It's used for people who are uh, violating certain traffic laws. And it's also used in a citywide uh, parking payment system. So you can pull into a parking spot and um, it can bill your car based on your license plate number. Here's one failure mode the designers probably didn't think of. Notice the guy's license plate? It's a giant drop table command. <clears throat> Little SQL injection on the license plate and they started pulling data out of the, the lower right image. They started pulling data out of the database. I've heard of people doing this with the automated police license plate readers. For a while, the most popular license plate number for the police license plate scanners was XXXXXXX because that's what a chain link fence is. So if I was a bad guy, I'd probably make my license plate all X's and they'd delete it at the end of the day when they delete all the chain link fences out of their database. <clears throat> so we've moved into this, these clouds of complexity. And not only that, we've virtualized these clouds. It's not enough to have the cloud, we've got to virtualize it. And in the move toward this uh, innovation, we've moved so quickly that I fear we've never really secured the fundamentals. And I don't really think this is intentional. I'm starting to think that maybe it's a tragedy of the commons issue. That because there is no one person or one group really in charge, therefore nobody is in charge. And we've ended up in a system where we're depending on technology where there's nobody actually really in charge in certain areas. If you look at this, my focus on fundamentals please slide, <clears throat> I've got these little red arrows. 2005 DNSSEC essentially gets pretty much codified in RFC 4035. 2005, it's like nine years ago. How well deployed is DNSSEC? Not, not very. 2002, we've got SMTP extensions for TLS. Okay, raise your hands. Are you using SMTP TLS extensions on your mail server? It's probably like a quarter or a fifth. And if you look at your traffic, I look at my traffic to my servers, I see about 20% traffic actually taking advantage of it. That's like 12 years ago. And, uh, and finally, secure web browsing, maybe because of Snowden or other issues, 
we see an acceleration in adoption. I see uh, Firefox just released their browser, number 27, that finally enables by default TLS 1.1 and 1.2 that were standardized, you know, six years ago. So for some reason the fundamentals are not being taken care of. We're inventing all kinds of new stuff, but we're not covering our bases. And that's led to the situation where you still can't send email securely today. You can't have a secure mobile conversation. Web browsing is essentially impossible. And name resolution is insecure. It's getting better with DNSSEC, but essentially it's insecure. Now, who would want to take advantage of this? That's all well and good, but we all, we all like each other. Who's going to abuse this? When I talk to audiences that aren't that familiar, I kind of try to break it down into four big, four, four, four big chunks. One is I say there's nation states. And generally nation states are interested in secrets. They want to know, are you breaking the treaty? Right? Your diplomats are telling us that you're not building cruise missiles. Well, guess what? The U.S. government is going to break into your government and we're going to find out, are you really building cruise missiles? And if you are, we're going to have some trouble. But, but we're not trying to monetize the results of what we find. We're trying to find out, are you complying with what you're telling us? Are you telling us the truth? Organized criminals want money. It's kind of hard to monetize the cruise missile secret. It's easier to monetize the credit card data. So you can see these two are sort of orth orthogonal. Or nation states have printing presses and can make money. Criminals don't really care a whole lot about secrets. If criminal organizations do care about secrets, it's because somebody's paying them to care about them, and that's probably a nation state. Third, we generally have protesters, I call these activists, whatever you want to call them. They're trying to draw attention to their cause. Their cause could be uh, abuse of whales. It could be anything. It could be uh, financial inequality on Wall Street. But they're trying to draw your attention to something. Think of it as a digital sit-in. And finally, we sort of have hackers and researchers. I think of these as the academic researchers, the professional hackers. They generally want knowledge. Right? We want to figure out how does it actually work? What can I make it do? Wasn't designed to do that? Well, too bad. I'm going to make it happen. And these guys are our crystal ball view into what's really going on in the world. They point the way of what's possible. Right? They are discovering new classes of vulnerabilities. They're talking publicly about poor products. Companies aren't going to tell you about their poor product design, but these guys will. They also spur public debate. You'll notice that criminals and governments don't do this. So I get really concerned when companies and governments want to pass laws or regulations to restrict what researchers and hackers can talk about publicly. Because if they're gone, we have very limited views of what's really happening in the technology world. The other interesting thing is all of these groups, these four groups, they need the network to work. You can't be stealing secrets if the network's down. You can't be stealing money if the network's down. And it's kind of hard to protest, too, if the network's down. So think of all the problems we have with our networks. Think of all the DDoS issues we're facing. And this is when everybody needs the networks to work. So I'm curious. Is there a fifth group out there that actually doesn't need the network to work? And I've been thinking about this for a couple of years, and I don't have an answer. So I don't know if there really is a fifth group out there, but I'd love to talk to you guys today, later on tonight, whatever, and get your thoughts on does a fifth group exist? Well, <clears throat> there is one group that was fairly close for a while there, <clears throat> and that was anonymous. And <clears throat> Back in, when was it, February 12th, 2012, they announced, or someone claiming to be anonymous, announced Operation Global Blackout. I love that name. It has like all the hallmarks of a great name. It's not just a blackout, it's global. So what they proposed doing was attacking all the root servers and taking the internet down, um, and they were kind enough to give us a 45-day warning. And so, I mean, that's 
I don't like having a global blackout, but if I am going to have a global blackout, 45 days heads up is pretty useful. And this was a problem for me personally because at the time I was working at ICANN as a chief security officer, and on the very first page of their bylaws, you can see the first paragraph there in blue, one of the missions of ICANN uh, is to ensure the stable and secure operation of the Internet's unique identifier systems, of which DNS is one of them. So I knew it was something that was going to take up my life for the next 45, 50 days. And it did. So one of the first things you get concerned about is how are they going to attack? What are you going to actually defend against? And if you look at the history of Anonymous, they really pretty much only attack in one way. It's generally denial of service attacks. This is like their forte. If you look at the tools they've written, how they organize ops, what they do is they float an idea. Op eat the rich. Op global blackout. And they see, like a popularity contest, are people going to side with me? Do people want to do op global blackout? And if it starts attracting a lot of mind share, you start to get people lining up behind it. And if you get enough people lined up behind it, then it's an actual op. If nobody lines up behind it, it kind of disappears. And they're all trial balloons. <clears throat> and depending upon who the person is within Anonymous that tries the trial balloon, it has more credibility or less credibility. So we immediately paid a lot of attention. Who floated the trial balloon? How many follows do they have? Do they have successful ops behind them? Right? How seriously should we take these guys? And so, OK. Let's say they're going to attack us with denial of service. This is my Jeff Moss back of the napkin chart of denial of service attacks. It's not based on anything scientific. This is based on me asking around in the industry and saying, what's the largest DDoS flow you've ever seen? And back in 2010, the biggest flow anybody saw on target was about 36 gigs. It's like, OK, 36 gigs in 2010. By 2011, it was about 82. So in a year, we more than doubled. It was about 82 gigs on target, 2010. <clears throat> that red dotted line is the 100 gigabit, um, or the fastest switch port that I've seen, 100 gigabit switch port. So you're saturating switch ports when you cross that red line. So by the time they uh, announced this attack, the largest was about maybe 120 gigabits flow. So what do I have to be prepared to absorb? How many hundreds of gigs? The red line is when they um, announced it. And that next little blob, March 2012, is when the attack would have happened. And they're up to about 142 gigs. And since then, the, the most recent one we see with the uh, spam house, that was about 309 gigs total generated. And, um, and we were tracking someone who claims to have over a terabit of flow at his disposal by compromising um, over 20 million home CPE equipment routers. Now, whether you believe that or not, what are you going to do with the terabit of flow? Right? You're never going to get a terabit of flow on me because it's going through you. It's going through your networks. You're going to absorb it all before it even pops out that little pipe and hits one of my servers. So really, there's a throttling, there's a limit to how much target, how much traffic you can get on us because your layer, the IX layer, is going to be taking the hit. And if you look at the trends, here's something that um, Prolexic does. Just look at that circle. See the 76% number there in the middle? That's for infrastructure attacks, the infrastructure layer that's used in a DDoS attack. This is from third quarter of 2012. So yeah, they're going to come at you with the infrastructure layer. And by 2013, fourth quarter, well, I probably shouldn't have picked red. But you can see all the numbers are up. In one quarter, 151% peak packets per second. Average attack has increased to 10, uh, 10 million packets per second. So in one quarter, 151% in packets per second. So the trend line is, you know, like a hockey stick. That's the future you would have to face if you were trying to protect uh, root servers. Now, of course, we all know that attacking the root is really, really difficult. It's distributed. It's any casted. Nobody has ever successfully attacked it. And the general wisdom in the room is that, good luck, Anonymous, you can try. Try all you want. Not going to happen. 
And there were a lot of people that were pretty smug about this. They'd sit around and laugh and insult Anonymous and say, oh, those jackasses, they're not going to be able to do anything. And of course, people in our industry, security industry, we're pretty smart and sometimes pretty smug. And uh, one guy, Rob, wrote this article at Errata Security, and he listed all the reasons why this attack was going to fail. He had six of them. Active response, diversity of the networks and software, any casting, really fat pipes and pipes that can scale even faster, GTLD servers that are going to be between the root and the queries, potentially, and caching. It's like, okay, that's a pretty good uh, assessment. That's what I'm counting on. I'm counting on a lot of that stuff to protect me. But he couldn't help himself. He threw this little tidbit in at the very end of his article, which is, but I think I might be able to do it, given six months and some smart friends. It's like, <laughs> what, what makes you think you can do it with some smart friends, but Anonymous can't? I mean, is that what you always do to your adversaries? You like poke them in the ribs and say, here's all the reasons they're going to fail except for me, I'm the smart guy? How many people do you think that spurred on to keep looking deeper, right? So then people say, well, nobody's going to take down the root. Okay, I agree with you. Somewhere on the planet, you're going to be able to resolve traffic at the root. I get that. But what if one or two or three of these things fail, right? As a technician, we're like, well, whatever. There's 13 of them. As long as one's working and there's stuff in caches, you'll still resolve. But that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, what if they fail, one or two or three? Does that make the news? If that makes the news, what does that mean? If that makes the front page of the Wall Street Journal, what does that mean? Does that mean you go in front of Congress and testify that we have an insecure internet and we need to fix something because it's broken? If one failing is OK, is five failing OK? Is this the debate you want to have at the ITU or with the UN or with Russia? Right? What is an acceptable amount of failure? Our answers of, well, it's not going to fail, um, you know, don't make politicians around the world sleep better at night. If you look at this map, look closely. Do you notice some countries that don't have any root instances at all? Like none. Those countries are 100% dependent on other countries around them to provide root instances. Not even, you know, a real root server. They're just root instances. Do you think they'll care if the root is not reachable? And do you think they'd try to change that situation? There was one, uh, there's a story. A president of a country who de his economy depends on the internet realized that the press, com the press coverage of this attack op blackout um, made him concerned. So he turned to his advisors and he says, you know, our country depends on the internet. Um, is that going to impact us? And they said, well, you know what? We don't have any uh, root servers. And that's what they're going to attack, and we don't have any. And his response was, get me the internet. He thinks you can like, pick up the phone and call the internet. So this is basically what the uh, aide tells him. Well, this is who runs the internet. See, there are these uh, multi-party, multi-stakeholder organization, and we all get together in a collaborative method. And do you think that impressed the president? Or do you think if his country was offline, he's going to want a solution? And I'm told the answer was, well, that's going to change. So there's many consequences more than just having it go offline. So then the question is, well, we don't want it to go offline. What's our technique for defense? How do you defend? If it's DDoS, if we've chosen DDoS as their preferred method of attacking us, I've got two options, right? I limit their tools they can use to generate attacks against me. I can increase the amount of traffic I can absorb. I've got two options. Ideally, I'd be doing both. But I can't do both. I don't have the budget to do both. So I do the second thing. I'm going to increase the amount of traffic I can absorb. So here's basically ICANN runs one of the 13 root servers that runs LRoot. And back before this attack, we had about 40 instances any casted around the world. Here's where we were. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how much traffic can any one of these instances absorb? I couldn't tell you that. 
How large is the pipe going to any one of these things? Well, couldn't really tell you that either. We're not really big in sharing about information around the route. We're pretty protective around it. But this is the information that the attackers can find online. So they can design their attack accordingly. Because we don't have a lot of money, what we do is we distribute LRoot instances to anybody essentially who wants them. So that tends to be on the edge. We don't have money to host an IXs or try to do it in Europe. <laughs> Probably not going to be successful. But if you wanted to get a story in the newspaper about being the route not being available, you might try Australia, English speaking press, only a couple of servers. And if you look at the root servers over time, this is another Jeff Moss graph, so uh, it's probably not terribly complete. If you look at it on the left, that number 40, that's how many servers ICANN had at the beginning of the attack that I could try to bolster my defenses with. We had 92 by the time the attack was supposed to happen. And then now the scale gets off because it's many months in between or maybe a year in between. And you can look at the total number of servers at ICANN has leveled off. It's not scaling anymore. It's not growing. It's not going to be able to absorb a larger attack if the attacks continue to grow. Well, that's ICANN. Look at all the other root servers. There are all these other guys down here. You know, those straight lines that you see? They just haven't grown or grown very slowly. <clears throat> and if you look at the top, what I've tried to capture is that over the last 15 months, they've added 44 servers. When it looked like we were under threat, we added more than that in a month and a half. So there's just not a lot of pressure right now to have a lot of capacity at the root. We can argue over why or what the political situation is. <clears throat> now, if I was a betting man and I was an attacker and I was looking at this list of the 13 root server operators, these are the letter of the root servers and how many any cast or uh, actual instances they have. If you were an attacker, which ones would you go after? Right? If you want to get on the news and claim you took down some root servers, there's several up there that don't look all that difficult. So then it goes back to the question of, well, what does that mean? Right? Does that get you on the front page of Time Magazine because you took down the untake downable root? This is what an attack looks like. Normal query traffic are these little bands down below based on our uh, locations. So if you look, blue is Europe. So this was somebody going after our Prague data center um, one day. So the thing that kills name servers is uh, query rate, queries per second. And normal query rates like around 10,000 queries per second. We peaked out over a little bit over 105,000 queries per second, that big blue spike. So you have to have an insane amount of surge capacity because the bad guys know this and they're going to throw a lot of QPS at you. This is what it looks like when we're defending against it and we're putting in resource rate limiting or we're throttling. Right? You can see us adjusting different bands over different months playing with different levels. Um, and we'll adjust our rate limiting based on the size of the attack we're currently seeing. You can use tools um, to monitor the health of the root. Here's a G root, G root under attack. So you see all these little red lines up and down the side. This is um, non responses or uh, really slow responses, responses out of the norm. This is what an attack would look like. This is what an attack would not look like. That's a big horizontal line. That's a sensor, a probe that's gone bad. Doesn't mean anything. That's the one you would care about. So, so when I would talk to people about this and they'd fixate on queries per second, I would always go back to these second order consequences. And so I tried to draw this. The core of it was the op blackout. The immediate impact was root capacity. Can we absorb their attack? Okay, well, there's different things we, we can, the whole community, we had a great coordinated response. We coordinated with Interpol to figure out could they be a useful place to coordinate a response in a global attack? I don't know. Nobody knew. Let's figure it out. Let's see if Interpol is a good location. If you noticed on that chart, almost all the servers are in America except for three. 
So if there's an attack, U.S. government's going to be really interested in it because almost all the root servers are in this country. So we coordinate with DHS and the NCIC. We coordinate with the FBI. Because it's going to be a criminal act, we're probably going to need to coordinate with law enforcement. So we have some really great outcomes coordinating responses. But we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about the political considerations. It was very taboo. It's like, don't talk about that stuff. If you say that out loud, it may happen. And this is one of my problems. National pride. You've got 13 root servers, really 12 because VeriSign has two. But if you look at the number of countries that actually have root servers, there's four. There's America, Sweden, Japan, and Norway. Then there's some, a lot of countries that have instances, but look at that list on the bottom. These are countries that have no root instances at all. Nothing. Their traffic goes over their borders to somebody else to do a root resolution. Do you think any of those countries care? Do you think they'll care when their economy is more dependent on the internet? So here's another interesting question for you guys. What if somebody helped out? What if it wasn't just a bunch of anonymous people? Right? What if it was in the best interest of a nation state to see, to make sure that anonymous succeeds? Maybe that will help that nation state in whatever their current geopolitical argument is. Right? Well, OK, let's sit around and make fun of anonymous. My concern is what happens if a nation state gets behind them? How do I detect and prevent that? Right? We haven't even talked about maybe anonymous or nation states got some zero day vulnerabilities. Right? Go look in your CVE in the last year. How many bind bugs have there been that have been pretty critical? You know, a handful. Well, what if a nation state or an individual actor has got some zero days? He's going to drop some zero days in along with it. People would drop into the room. We were monitoring. People would come in. They'd say, I'm ready to attack. Where's the tool? There was no tool. The next thing they'd say, well, what else am I going to do? Well, lucky for us, Op Syria was happening. The Syria civil war was starting to kick off, and that has some actual bad guys. Who doesn't want to go stop bad guys? So all the idealistic anonymous people went to Op Syria, and Op Syria had a huge boost. Op Blackout turned into just crickets in a ghost town. Lucky for me, right? Thank you, Op Syria. Well, not really, because a lot of people are suffering in Syria. But it impacted this op because it drew people away with a charismatic um, counter option. So in telling that story, I'm hoping you see there's many, many layers. We're not just technicians. We're not just trying to figure out a problem on a technical level. We are now operating in sort of a geopolitical world. And the decisions we make and the way you build your networks and the way you respond are going to influence the international debate on governance. And I have nine minutes left. So I was prepared for this in case I get excited and talk fast. I have just a couple extra slides left over. And one of them is to my point of DNS is just getting more important. And, uh, and the reason is I think people look at DNSSEC and they say, OK, I can publish something in DNS, and I can trust the answers. For one of the first times in history, I can publish something, and I can trust the answer. I can know if it's been tampered with. Well, what would I want to publish? What could I possibly want to publish? How about pictures of my cat? Do I want to turn DNS into a giant repository of cat pictures that you can trust? How about recipes? How about directions? How about source code? I don't know. It's a giant repository now that can take data and deliver it to you, and you can trust the answer more than you can trust the answer of SSL. What do you think clever business people are going to do with that? They're going to invent stuff we've not even thought of, and they're going to stuff it into DNS because they want to know they can trust the answer. One of the first things they're doing with this is they're using DNS as a policy signal. I'm going to show my policy interests to you over DNSSEC so I know it can be not tampered with. And we're going to do this with resource records. And if you look at what the resource records are, the coming policy signals, you see things like the certification authority authorization, the CAA record. I'm going to tell the world which CAA should be signing the certs for my domain or for my zone. 
That seems like a pretty good signal. I can prevent all these other CAs in the world from, if they get compromised, issuing certificates for me. I can publish X509 certs for whatever reason. I can use it for uh, anti-spam purposes with sender policy framework. I could publish SSH key fingerprints, right? try to get around man-in-the-middle attacks. One of the big winners that we expect to be the first, uh, I guess, hit of DNSSEC is DANE, the TLSA Certificate Association, because this allows me to cut CAs completely out of the picture if I want to. I don't have to, but if I want to, I can now be 100% trust agile. I can change my trust in a minute's notice and signal to all the browsers in the world and all the users of the world which cert, cert they should trust. I don't have to reissue the cert. I don't have to go revoke things from a third party. I control my destiny. And so I think for certain organizations, TLSA records are going to be really popular because you now are in charge of your destiny. And for the same reason, it's not a standard yet, but the SMIME A resource record. This is a record where you can publish your SMIME cert fingerprint in DNS. Now when my MTA client goes to send you mail, instead of doing that whole trust on first use, SMIME, I talk to you, you send me the cert back, I just query your name server, I get your cert, and in the first time I talk to you, I encrypt using your SMIME cert. That is so much easier than dealing with PGP. So this level of automation, if you look at the end of the day, it could give us much more secure browsing. It could give us much more secure email. And now we're starting to really chip away at the problems I laid out, which was it's 2014 and you can't browse or email securely. Well, thanks to DNSSEC and the years to come, you can. And that's going to fundamentally change the nature of what we do with the internet. So think about it like this. How much more business would we all do if you could trust email from your attorney? If you could email the IRS and know that it's not, uh, get email from the IRS and know it's not spam or some kind of malware phishing. We're right at the cusp of a big change where all of a sudden we can start doing a whole nother quantum of business on the internet if we can start trusting the fundamentals and we're about to change that. Now it's really sort of early days Here's the number of domains with DS records for DNSSEC. You can see they're going up at a pretty fast clip, but it's still only about a percent. <clears throat> but at that trajectory, adoption is going to accelerate over the next couple of years, and you need to be ready for it. And if you look at worldwide um, availability of DNSSEC, everything that's green <clears throat> is currently available. Uh, and you can see deployment status on the right. These are for CC TLDs. My point is with this slide, the majority of all internet users in the world today um, can use DNSSEC or will be able to very shortly. And DNSSEC is gonna enable a whole other spectrum of use. What it's gonna do though, from a security standpoint, is it's gonna put another layer, it's gonna make things more fragile. Your DNS server better be really secure because now your DNS secure, your DNS server is acting as sort of keys of the kingdom for SSH, for certificates, for spam, for web servers, SSL certs, for email. You're trusting a lot in your name server. How often do you guys update your name servers? Right? We don't think of name servers like firewalls that have to be impenetrable. But you better start thinking of your name server as a firewall because that's exactly what it's going to be pretty soon. It's going to be a policy signal to the world And so I just put together this sort of slide. If this is what security today looks like, you got email on the left with these records, you got SMTP TLS, which 20% of the people use, SPF records, DKM records, HSTS headers. Well, once you add DNSSEC and the records that are available, this is sort of the view of the world. And you're gonna see more and more resource record types getting jammed into DNS to do more and more things. So from now until 2016 onward, this is what's going to be happening. You're going to see movement in DNSSEC, Dane, IPv6. And on the uh, RPKI front, the signed resource record uh, repository, you're all more familiar with that than I am. We're already signing RPKI keys right now for the 5RIR regions. What's going to change is 
ICANN is going to get the root key for the R, uh, RPKI. So just like ICANN has the root key, it's going to end up with sort of the key to own them all uh, for RPKI. And that puts ICANN in an interesting position. It has the two keys that rule the internet. And that's not such a big deal right now for RPKI, whether you sign a zone or not for resource instantiation. But what's going to be the big deal is when people decide to start making policy decisions based on what's signed, then it starts getting scary. Because if you sign something improperly and policy decisions are made on it, you could potentially stop routing traffic. So now I'm really finished. I want to thank you for patiently listening to this. I've got some minutes for questions and answers, and I'm around all day today and tomorrow. So thank you very much. Hope I've made you think. Yep, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Washer. Uh, I work with Internet Systems Consortium, and one of my day jobs is operating a root server. Yes. Um, wow. Uh, I'll focus my, 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 my comment to the actual root server portion of it. Um, you notice how I, I didn't go into a lot of detail there. Uh, yes. Um, because for the rest of it, I will couch it in terms that many of us will probably understand watching Mythbusters. Um, I reject your reality and substitute my own. Yep. Um, <laughs> several, I mean, I will say it, state it as several of the root server letters have been any casting for many years. Yeah. Before L root did. Sure. Um, the way that, and it's publicly known, so I can repeat this, is the way that Fruit does it is that we have global nodes and we have local nodes. Right. So we spread the load, um, and and where we have a Fruit server location at an IX, whether it be in South America or Africa or Middle East, um, we concentrate that local traffic there. Right. So we have seen in situations for most of these DDoS attacks that yes, we do get attacked, but they're very localized, or they hit the global nodes, and most of the rest of the constellation doesn't really see much. Right. Yeah, that's our experience too. And 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 so basically, yes, you could go through detailed intelligence and basically look through zone files and so forth to try to find how we communicate between the servers and, and back home and 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 so forth. But it would take a lot of effort. And um, speaking as someone who went through the the anonymous experience, um, I can tell you point of fact that we were not smug. Um, oh, no. I wouldn't say the root operator is smug. I would say that experts, the, the peanut gallery out there writing these mm -hmm. articles saying that there's nothing to be worried mm -hmm. about, I, the, the people three hops away were the ones that were creating this tone mm -hmm. that was not helpful. And, and, and for the coverage. Per se, as yeah. you pointed out, uh, sort of in, in various parts of the world, don't have root servers. Um, I know several of the letters who do actively try to deploy um, in in certain countries. ISC has partnership agreements with several of the RIRs. Um, we try to go uh, for F, for example. We have a handful of U.S. nodes. The rest of our 50 plus nodes are overseas or outside yeah. the U.S. Um, so we are very cognizant of getting the internet to the community, cl as close to the community as possible. The other things you have to factor in, of course, are also the CCTLD servers, the GTLD servers. I mean, yes, you can have a root server inside a country, but their CCTLD servers right. are still outside. Right, right. Oh, you, well, Estonia had that problem mm -hmm. when they were attacked back in the day. They so. So we, we, we do have, um, we are very cognizant of, of the issue, and we try to address them as, 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 as much as we can. Well, I, I hope you're not taking it to mean that the, the root operators aren't cognizant. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to realize the root operators do this for essentially zero profit. They've been doing it for 15 years longer than ICANN's been in existence. Mm -hmm. And it's a labor of love for these guys, and nobody knows the systems better than they do. So outside of that community, there's a lot of mythology around how roots work, how they're vulnerable or not vulnerable. And during this attack, it was exposing some of those issues to bad guys that was not useful. What would you consider a bad or a bad side effect of that? Of exposing these weaknesses? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, 
we both know lots of vulnerabilities that mm -hmm. would make an attack much easier. So talking about those publicly is not useful. I'm sure. not in a position to patch the root server. Maybe you are now. Mm -hmm. You already probably know about them. You're in a position to do something. If I tell the general population of attackers in the world the weakness, it's not useful. Um, we, we can have a side conversation about that, but, but I think that the... Look, so here, here's an example. Okay. Would you publish the total queries per second fruit can absorb? Like, when do you start caring about DDoS attacks? Uh, how many gigs of flow? How many mm -hmm. QPS on which targets? When do you get worried? Mm -hmm. If somebody comes to you and says, you know what, we have intelligence that somebody's going to point 200 gigabits at fruit, mm -hmm. Would you say, great, no problem? Or do you, have you already done the math and you know? Like, I, if I knew that answer, I wasn't, I'm not going to publish it mm -hmm. and tell the world how much traffic I can absorb. Yeah, and there's, and there's, currently, and there's currently proposals um, in front of our SAC to basically start publishing um, query levels and public statistics and so forth. So yes, we, we still have more openness to, yeah. to, uh, uh, to deal with. Um, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, we, we, we are fully participant in the public, uh, public stakeholder, yeah. and 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 so so yeah. But what I'm trying to get at is 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 that um, we are cognizant of the issues. We are dealing with them. Um, just stating that I can has 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 added like a hundred more servers, but the other Anycast clouds have done nothing. No, I think but sort of misrepresents the issue. But if you look at that graph, they did a lot quickly, mm -hmm. and then really nothing since. Because the, the problem is over. And yes, but that says that we, that sort of indicates that we weren't taking care, or. Yeah. We'll, Let's, have, I mean, we'll have a conversation yeah, offline. Exactly. But yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You go. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Daniel Karrenberg. I'm the chief scientist at the RIPE NCC. I'm also the inventor and implementer of this monitoring tool you showed, DNSMON. DNSMON is a great tool. Yeah, and we're improving it. Uh, there's, there's going to come a new version which uh, has been written by someone who, or some people who know much more about user interfaces than I did when I did it, so watch this space. Uh, I've also been responsible for operating Kroot for, I guess, uh, two decades, or well, almost. I'm off the hook now. So, so, so five, uh, years, five years longer than I can so, spend around. So, so, so much for who I am. Um, I have a couple of comments. Mm. Uh, one of them is that I'm not really happy with your, your uh, implication that if someone uh, were to take out all the root uh, name server instance in, say, Australia, uh, that Australia would be offline. Well, That's total nonsense. Right. Excuse me. No, um, no, you've let, got me, let, me, let me finish, uh, and then you can respond. Uh, the, th the thing is that uh, Australian users are not necessarily using all of them, or even maybe a fraction of them, right. the, the uh, root server instances in Australia. So that's something, you know, while I give, while I concede your argument that it's a political, it would be a political thing. It's like, that's, oh, we took off all that's uh, what it would be. those. Yeah. Um, you know, Australian internet users would probably not notice. Yeah. Right. That, that's important right, to right. say. Well, and we haven't talked about caching and negative caching and all the other things that would yeah. mitigate the size of these attacks. Yeah. Um, just so that you know, the press in the room doesn't get the wrong uh, impression. The, the other one is, uh, and, I, and that's kind of uh, um, similar to what the previous intervention question asker or whatever said, uh, was that uh, the number of instances is not the only criterion of resiliency. Right. Um, you had Kroot up there with 17 instances, and that's an order of magnitude less than what Lroot has. But we have a slightly different um, design um, because our instances are mostly near uh, internet exchange points and things like that. That's what I was trying to point out, where okay, we take fine. the cheap route and other people take the high capacity IX or peering exactly, point route. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there's also, um, um, and the, the other dimension here is if the more instances you deploy, um, uh, the more difficulty you have with actually monitoring them and making sure that they um, don't, get, don't get hijacked and uh, actually provide the right answers, mm -hmm. which at the moment still is a concern because not everything is DNSSEC. 
and actually not, not every resolver uses DNSSEC. So what we do at KROOT, just to give an example, is we, we um, stress much more that we monitor uh, and that we're sure that we give the right answers, which you cannot do uh, as well if you have like an order of magnitude more instances. Right. And I think, and I'm not criticizing uh, uh, ICANN's strategy with L. I think it's, uh, it's complementary to what the right. others do. And right. this is my point, and a really strong point I want to make, is that this diversity that we have among the operators is actually a feature. It's the yeah. main feature here um, that uh, there are different, different organizations responsible and different strategies of making this work. So I'm not that worried about the route. Um, one little side point again about the zero day attack. I think this diversity also gives you, gives us, all of us, more assurances that these uh, root servers will continue operating because they operate different software, different, different operating systems. You know, I've also been instrumental in getting uh, uh, another uh, um, implementation of, uh, uh, you know, th that we don't, that yeah. they're not totally de uh, dependent on bind and things like that. Yeah, no, we so it's not all that, it's not all that bleak as you, as you mentioned. Yeah. And there's one little point I still have to make, you know, okay. because I work for a, 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 a regional registry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's by no means certain, and you, you alluded to in a side comment, yeah. that the RPKI uh, root key would reside with ICANN. I that's by no means decided. So I, th I thought they didn't make the, I'm sorry, maybe you can clarify that because I, I heard that was a takeaway from the IETF meeting in Europe, the last meeting. Well, maybe um, that was a mischaracterized thing. I, I, I think uh, the regional internet registries will have a say in that and I don't think all the, co all the uh, well, communities, specifically the RIPE community, uh, is not happy with, uh, with a solution like that. Yet, maybe yeah. it will be in the future, but certainly, as to my knowledge, this is not a foregone conclusion. Yeah, the, the way it was portrayed to me was that ICANN didn't ask for it. The community came to them and said, "Will you hold the key?" And uh, that, that was new news to me. That might have been the IETF, but the IETF is not the operators. Yeah. So you made several good points. I'll just speak to one, which was your diversity comment, and. Um, <coughs> We mapped the diversity of software, of resolvers. If there's a zero day in this software, what percentage of total root traffic would go down? I mean, these, these analyses have been done, so you have to figure out, well, how many total zero days on how much software to make a you know, significant degradation. And some providers, I'm not going to name them, have two complete stacks. They run bind with HP switches, and they run something else with you know, somebody else's switches. And they have two complete uh, alternative pathways into their resolution centers to get even more diversity. Um, and so I think diversity, like I pointed out, you know, you, just, you diversify to increase resilience. And that's something the roots have always done well. Exactly. And, yeah. and it's not just the software, it's also the management and the responsibilities. Yeah. We have a couple more questions in the queue when we're starting to run short on time. Right. So I'll ask you to keep, uh, stick to a single question and keep it brief. Uh, over here to my left is next up. OK. Mr. Yeah. So me, you. Uh, Warren Kamari, part of the ICANN Security and Stability Advisory Committee, also chair of the Dane Working Group. Yes. Um, so I think you misrepresented fairly badly a number of things. Okay. For and I'm example, sure you'll tell me what I did wrong. Sure. For example, <laughs> the actual importance of the root. Okay. Taking down most of the letters really isn't going to matter technically. Yes, there'll I'm, be some political fallout and PR fallout. Yes. But it's fairly easy to mitigate that by saying, look, the internet still works, right? There'll be a few minutes of people panicking. It's easy to prove it's still working. This is a feature, not a bug. So, so what I was trying to portray there mm -hmm. was that in Washington, D.C., in the circles of people I talk to, it would not be a trivial thing. It would be a really, really bad thing. And technical people weren't thinking that way. Perhaps it's that the message that's being presented has some sort of bias, right? Like yeah. this would be really bad. Yeah. Um, the other thing is you've had a list of countries who, you know, national pride, they don't have a name server, oh my God, they're disadvantaged. I'm I not saying they're disadvantaged, I'm just saying what if they want? If they want one, yeah. F will give them one, L will give them one, many of the other root, root operators will happily provide them an instance, they just need to ask. Right. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't saying that's off limits. I'm just saying that you would think in today's world, maybe an organization could
could donate a root instance to make sure every country, every CC, one of the initiatives we were trying to do was make sure every country in the world has an instance. The thing is, it's not, it doesn't actually matter if a country has an instance. As long as a country has some connectivity, that's the important bit. But if they have an instance and there's no connectivity, it's of no use to them. But at layer eight, politically, it's of huge importance to them. If it's of huge importance to them, they can call L and say, please give me an I, instance. Right, right. I'm just saying, we're, we're at that point where seven and eight are merging. I think you'll be the last question. Okay. Um, Keith Mitchell, DNS Award. Um, I, I think you made a fairly clear statement of the problem. It's a problem space that's very familiar to me because my own organization. Oh, can you move the microphone down just a bit? Thank you. Too short. Um, that's better. Sorry, you've made a very clear statement of the problem, which is a problem space that's very familiar to me because my own organization's remit is um, protecting the DNS infrastructure. Um, I think the good news is that um, a lot of people are very familiar, you know, as some of the previous questioners have flagged up, there's a lot of people who are very familiar with the problem space yeah. um, and have been working on it. The bad news is, uh, well, the problem isn't solved yet. Um, I think in terms of not just stating the problem, but what are the solutions? Some of the solutions are um, measurement, um, distributions of awareness, um, coordination, um, you know, community sharing of information. Um, you know, we, we, we do all of these. Um, I think that um, there are probably other things that we can do as well. Uh, you know, if I turn this around and, and, and I would encourage people in the room um, who are concerned about this, who are, who are infrastructure operators who are concerned about DNS, um, please participate in the work. Please support. Um, you know, th there are more resources that can be put into this space. If I turn my comments around into a question for you, I think mm -hmm. it is, apart from the various technologies that you stated, what else can we be doing to solve this problem that we are not already doing? I would um, love I would love to see, it doesn't have to be public, it can be private. You know, there's already the day in the life of data the root operators collect and analyze. It's one of the only windows we have into the total picture. I would love to see a coordinated exercise. Uh, in the corporate world, we do penetration tests. Let's do a penetration test confidentially of the root system and try to figure out, well, we all see when bad guys attack it through DDoS attacks. Let's put together our own test. Isn't that what engineers and pen testers do in the real world? Um, to my knowledge, that's never happened. So there, there are things you say. They don't have to be in the full light of day, but they're things we can do to get more confidence or to exercise our capabilities, our response capabilities more. And, and, and just one final comment I'll make is, you know, you talk about all these DDoS attacks that can happen against not just the DNS infrastructure, but everything. Right. What is the main way that DDoS attacks happens? It's spoofed source addresses. And I right. think that, you know, everybody in this room um, and the regulators as well, I'm afraid, need to work on BCP38 source address validation. That's yeah. one of the things that will make the internet more secure. Now I had on that one slide, I was like, address the core problem or scale capacity. If we took option one, we'd go down this whole road, a whole other presentation I give in DC, which is BCP 38, um, you know, reverse pass forwarding, all of these technologies to prevent spoofing, because at the end of the day, that's the solution. And what really frustrates me and from a Washington DC standpoint is I hear from both sides. I hear from the legislators and the advisors to the representatives, and I hear from industry. And it goes something like this. Um, this is what the representatives tell me. My lobbyists tell me that it's too dangerous to tamper with the internet standards. Any technical solution, the internet moves so quickly, if we codify something in some policy or regulation, um, it'll be gone by the next day and will actually have harmed the internet. And my response is, well, BCP 38's been around for almost 20 years. I don't see anything in the future that's going to change the need for BCP38, whether it's V6 or V4. And if you codified or had some policies around BCP38, CPE gear by default will comply with BCP38. If you want to sell something to the US government, it needs to have BCP38 enabled by default. Whatever, I don't care. They get pushed back by the industry saying that that's going to damage the internet. And so we're having this fundamental disconnect argument over BCP38. And you know, there's a lot of people in this room who spent a lot of time trying to get BCP38 done. Um, and I'm, I'm right there with you. I, 
That's the key to a lot of the problems we're all facing. And it's not a sexy solution, and it's been around for 20 years, which is really depressing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. And we have one question coming in uh, from remote, actually. Uh, Mehmet Aiken, formerly of ICANN, asked, uh, Jeff, do you think root servers who aren't able to expand as fast as others are, are unable to do so due to financial restrictions in operation? And should ICANN consider supporting root servers? Well, not working at ICANN anymore. Um, I think <laughs> if you didn't hear the question, it's uh, the ones, the root servers that want to expand faster but can't, should ICANN, what, financially support them somehow? I think. Um, to the point that was brought up earlier, right? different root operators have different strategies, and that diversity is a strength. Um, I think uh, the more root servers distributed any cast, the better. Okay. I don't know. I don't control ICANN's budget, but I, I did. <laughs> I was a supporter of the strategy of if you're a CC somewhere in the world and you want one, we'll help you get one. I think that would be really valuable. Whether it's needed or not, it will just make them feel included in the community, involved in the process, and feel that they're part of the global internet. Whether or not technically it's needed or not, I think those other benefits are, are pretty important. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.